So uh, we are really pleased to have Dr. Pamela Marina, uh, Marino here today. And um, uh, Dr. Marino is the former chief of biochemistry and bio-related chemistry at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. And Pamela joined uh, NIGMS in 1994 and played uh, some very critical roles in raising the profile of the field of glyphoscience and bringing it into the mainstream. Dr. Marino was a key leader in the Consortium for Functional Genomics and later was instrumental in helping to establish the NIH Glycoscience Common Fund. Today, she is going to tell us a bit about the history of the NASM Glycosciences Report and the subsequent activities at NIH around glycosciences and how they were impacted by the NASM report. And I, from everything I've heard, uh, there we're going to be able to learn a lot from uh, uh, Dr. Marino's experience. So um, please go ahead and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Great. I can't see you when I'm in presentation mode. That's why I have to ask. So um, I want to thank Steve for inviting me. And I wasn't really sure what I could bring to the RNA community when I first heard about this. Um, Carolyn Bertozzi recently discovered that uh, that RNA is decorated with glycans, and there's uh, considerable effort going on now to, to determine what they do. So that was my first thought is, oh, another area for glycobiology. But then I realized after talking to Steve, you're really interested more in process. So um, I asked him for some specific questions, and um, these are the ones that he gave me. So I'm going to try to address these uh, very brief with some very brief slides. I'm going to really rip through these. So um, hang on to your hats. And um, then I'll take questions from you folks. Um, Hopefully, when I give this presentation, most of these questions will be answered, but, um, but I think it's important to give you some time to ask me questions. So the role of a federal program staff, program officer. Yeah, um, oh, okay, yeah. I was just making sure your slides were advancing. Yes. The role of, you can sure? you see that? Yeah. Saying? Okay, so the role of a federal program officer and the tools that are available them to move their portfolios um, are pretty unique. Um, and I'll go over those a little bit. But paramount to this is the use of outside opinions to identify research opportunities. And um, then it's incumbent on the program officer to find mechanisms to address these opportunities. Um, in my case, it was glycomics and glycoscience. So program directors have they handle portfolios of grants. They advise on the priorities for committing federal funds. They act as advocates to scientific areas. They advise on the development of emerging areas of research initiatives, operating procedures, and policies. And most important, they serve as a fiduciary for federal funds, which always has to be taken into consideration. Pam. In 1995, my portfolios Can you hear us, Pam? We yes, have I can. I, I don't see your slides advancing. Are are you? Um, and you don't see, you don't see them I, going forward. Yeah, can you try moving them forward? Sorry, Dr. I think uh, I misunderstood. Um, if you'd like to share your slides on your own behalf, can you try sharing the screen again? Um. Yeah, I'm sharing my entire screen. Uh, in Zoom or elsewhere. Actually, muted. You're, you're muted. I did it from um, from share screen. Did, did it not work? We're still on the first one. Can you see if you can go forward? Um, sure. Go, go to the, it's the, the left corner to go, to go forward. And Is that changing now? Can you, can you try sharing your, your screen again one more time for me? Sorry about this. You want me to share a screen again? Uh, it's not working. Do you want to share the slides for me? 
I emailed them to you. Yep, I got you. Sorry about that. All right. Just one second. I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, no problem. I don't have Zoom, so I'm working off of your web connection. There you go. You okay, can I advance those or do you need to advance them? Uh, I can give you control to. Uh, I can advance them on your behalf if you'd like to sell me the report. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to break your flow again, but you can. Yeah, we don't have to. Okay, um, so this is the information that was requested. And how do I forward this? There we go. Um, there are tools available. Next slide. Next slide. So glycans are the third information rich molecule uh, polymer in the um, in the human body, um, after nucleic acids and proteins, but we don't have, or we didn't have good tools to study these, to synthesize them, to understand their structures. And so it was incumbent on our portfolio to actually try to make an attempt to provide those tools. Next slide. In 95, when I, I embarked on this, um, both NIH and NSF had interest in the field. NSF had a database called CarBank that was en ending, and both their bio and chemistry directorates were interested in this. GM had my portfolio, NCRR had two centers, and several other institutes were supporting some glycoscience awards, but didn't have portfolios in this area. Next slide. <coughs> so the charge that was given to me was to expand the glyco uh, conjugate portfolio. And going about this as a program officer, I could raise awareness through meetings and workshops. I could seek partnerships and leverage resources. That meant partnering with staff who shared interests from other institutes and agencies. And I could utilize opportunities to initiate or augment um, existing initiatives or try to develop new initiatives. Those would be through funding opportunity announcements and over the course of the last 20, 20 years, things like the Eureka program, the ERA program, through supplements, through small business, and through intramural NIH itself. Next slide. So in 98, um, Dr. Zuhuni took over NIH and the NIH budget was doubling. Um, by NIGMS standards, uh, large team science was not something we embraced, but because of the doubling, it was something that we had to embrace. And so we developed a program called the Glue Grant Initiative. These were $5 million awards, um, 10 years and to solve a major initiative in, um, in research. And also in 99, the first high throughput tools for studying glycans came, came about. These were glycan arrays. Um, and at that point in 99, if someone scanned all of the glycan libraries that were commercially available, you could come up with less than 100 purified glycans to put on an array. Uh, 100 glycans to study uh, an infinite field of structures is not very good. By February of 99, um, at a Gordon Research Conference, I made a presentation to them on large collaborative grant mechanisms, the Glue Grant Program, and suggested that this might be a great opportunity for the glyco community to coalesce and come in with a large co collaborative grant to study glycans and address the issues to bring the field into the glycomics era. Uh, the community caucus, they formed a steering committee and they decided to go after this grant. Next slide. Um, about the same time, NSF, who was also very interested in glycans, held a meeting and um, Laura Kiesling and Jerry Hart chaired that meeting to explore the future of glycoscience and the role of biology and chemistry in this area. 
And the meeting report that they developed called for the establishment of infrastructure, including chemical and biological tools, databases, a workforce, and integration with the broader scientific community. Eva Barak brought this uh, report to me at NIH, and given the Glue Grant program, and the opportunities to address these issues, this report was uh, part of the basis for convincing our council that uh, the glue grant program in glycoscience should go forward. Next slide. So where did we start? In genomics and proteomics, you have structures, sequencing, synthesis, tools, knockout models, databases, and a workforce. In glycomics, we had a few hundred structures. Mass spec was just being utilized to start sequencing. Uh, chemical synthesis was in its infancy. There was chemical, chemobiological, and biofermentation, but they were hampered by methodologies and lack of enzymes. There were few tools, uh, maybe a couple of dozen enzymes that had been synthesized by different groups, a uh, few probes, one high throughput assay few knockout models, uh, database was going under, and no workforce because there was no training grants. So we had a big mountain to climb. Next slide. The CFG was an experiment in large team science. It started out with about 30 people. It ended up with over 600 labs internationally and became a model for a large team science. It's been written up and it became one of the uh, successful programs that underpinned the, um, the uh, NIH roadmap that Dr. Zuhuni developed and which evolved into the Common Fund program. So they were going after structures, they were developing methods for sequencing, uh, for synthesis, they focused on chemoenzymatic, um, they developed new tools, knockout models, they developed a huge database that imported data through an electronic notebook that gathered information from all their cores. And the expectation was that people would be trained when they were working in this area. Because glycoscience is unique and the cores, they developed cores. Could I have the next slide, please? Several iterations of the program um, got written up and uh, eventually they settled on having a steering committee and then utilizing cores that were going to do all the work and people would just give them their, their uh, samples or they would provide resource, resources and compounds and libraries to people. But everything would be free. All of the data would go into um, an electronic notebook and be searchable through the consortium databases. So this set up a model for doing large team science that was open to the broader scientific community and obviously worked since it attracted over 600 labs over the course of 10 years. And they found ways to keep this going. So it's still an active consortium out of Harvard. Next slide, please. Next slide. Right. So the databases and partnerships that came out of this, um, obviously over 10 years, you know, you plan something the first, first year, by five years you renew it, but you know, things change, science progresses, and this science progressed very quickly. So we knew we had underfunded the informatics efforts, and so we held a workshop, we brought in people and experts, we talked about this, and it resulted in administrative supplements. These were $1 million administrative supplements to the informatics efforts in each of the GLUE grants to try to get their informatics up and running very quickly. Um, Japan, the CFG, NCI, NCRR, Dental, DK, the proteomics interest group at NIH, and Heart-Lung all came together and held the Frontiers in Glycomics, Bioinformatics, and Biomarkers Disease uh, workshop, which led to a, a white paper. And that ultimately led to the Alliance of Glycobiologists for Detection of Cancer and Cancer Risk, a UO1 program that's still go ongoing at NCI, and to the Programs for Excellence in Glycoscience, which is a PO1 program at Heart-Lung. So you can see this theme is developing here. You set something up, you bring in outside experts, you look at the field, you request what their interests are, what the needs are, how does this advance the field? You bring this back, you synthesize it into program efforts. Um, 
distill it down and then work with your institutes to develop programs that address the needs to move the science forward. And of course, these are always competing against other interests from other portfolios. So you need strong information from your outside experts to convince your institute that they should invest in a given program. Next slide. The Now Caught Mouse project was ongoing. Um, GM was given a million dollars to invest in that. And I convinced our director that the 22 glyco relevant strains on the list of available mice to purchase would be a great investment for the glyco field. And we ended up getting all 22 strains. Subsequently, we partnered with the comp program and completed all the mouse efforts uh, within the CFG through comp, which saved us about $300,000 a year, and we were able to move that money into other, other efforts. Next slide. Glycan synthesis libraries and standards was a sticking point. If you don't have the compounds and the compound libraries to do the screens or make the tools or understand the competitions, you can't move the science forward. So GM uh, wrote put together a, a meeting, uh, expanding the chemical space for carbohydrates. Rick Cummings, who was at Emory at that point and is now at Harvard, chaired that meeting. And that resulted in uh, GM's council giving us money to run an RFA for chemical synthesis. Child Health also had interest and they ran an FOA for the synthesis of human milk oligosaccharides, which is now a very active area for probiotics and, um, and commercialization. Um, the RFA was really successful. We developed a number of, of methodologies that had the potential to uh, move forward into uh, automation and to benefit the larger community from those efforts. Um, Carolyn Bertozzi ran a meeting called Expanding the Chemical Space for Carbohydrates, Roadmap to Automated Synthesis for NIGMS and GM's council approved a contract call for development of glycan libraries that funded about 15 companies uh, to develop libraries and put them out commercially. So now we went from 99 compounds back in 2000 to thousands of compounds by 2011. Next slide. Um, high throughput tools were gaining real real traction and uh, the CDC was using these to screen for the bird flu. Um, other arrays were starting to be developed. Uh, Jillian Eyre ran a workshop for us on, from, for us in AI on the information that was coming off of all of these different uh, glycan arrays that were being developed and how we would interpret these. And uh, this resulted in the CFG putting together bridge projects for cross-platform comparison of these diverse arrays and era supplements for development of new novel arrays and their characterization and ligand presentation. Next slide. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, was a unique opportunity for us to put in challenge grants um, for the functions of glycan binding proteins, synthesis structure and function of uh, glycans, and we were able to make eight awards through that act and beef up the infrastructure. Next slide. Glycoenzymes, especially enzymes for um, synthesis of, of carbohydrate compounds since uh, chemoenzymatic synthetic methodologies were becoming very popular. Um, Josh LeBaire had the, um, the libraries and uh, Kelly Mormon and Don Jarvis had um, expression systems for them. And these three got a large error supplement to be able to put this all together into a repository so people could order um, the expression vectors. Next slide. By 2011, um, the profile for carbohydrates and glycomics was becoming um, more high profile, certainly many more institutes and agencies were interested. And a number of workshops, actually a flurry of workshops between 2010 and 2012 uh, took place on the NIH campus. And these in turn um, led to both 
RFAs uh, and to interest by multiple agencies into doing a larger study of um, the field to see what needed to happen if we were going to take advantage of glycomics and glycomic efforts. Was this a place where we really needed to make a, a sincere investment? Next slide. So um, to sort of build interest across agencies and to coalesce what we wanted out of a report, um, NIAID issued U54s for resources uh, for innate and pathogen arrays. NIH's glycobiology SIG, which is an intramural effort of laboratories, put together a seminar series, a course in glycobiology in an annual meeting to raise interest on campus. And the Interagency Glycoscience Steering Committee that I chaired um, brought together NIH, FDA, NIST, NSF, and DOE um, to meet on a regular basis to discuss um, our shared interests and where we could partner. And one of those partnerships was between NIST and GM for developing glycan standards in mass spec libraries. This all raised interest between multiple federal agencies and institutes. And at this point, um, GM uh, went, to, um, went to OD and suggested that we commission a National Academy report in this area to look to see what needed to be done to move this field forward. And several agencies stepped up, DOE, FDA, NIH, multiple agencies within NIH, and um, put together the funding for assessing the importance and impact of glycomics and glycoscience. The report came out in 2012, um, and it was Transforming Glycoscience, a Roadmap for the Future. So this report has been used both by program officers at NIH and the multiple institutes to support funding for this field and to address the roadmap that was put together by, by the group, by Dr. Walt and his group. Um, but it's important to note that I've shown you that these reports of various types get used by program officers and staff across the federal agencies to understand their portfolios and to help develop funding opportunities to move the field forward. But we expect that these reports are going to be non-biased, that they're going to be honest reports that show us where the opportunities are, where the deficiencies are, and to lay out what needs to be done if we're going to take advantage of the recommendations that people that are writing these reports um, are giving us. So whatever you can do to tailor your report to where are the opportunities and who's going to benefit from those things and what do we need to do in terms of a timeline to actually bring these things to fruition in a timely manner. Those are the type of things as a program officer, I would look for in a report to justify making an FOA pitch to my institute for money. Next slide. The committee um, was held, a, put together a great report. It was chaired by David Walt and David, we brought David back actually later in the program to do an evaluation of the chemistry um, portion of, of the common fund. So I'll talk about that a little later, but remember his name. Next slide. This provided, this report provided a roadmap and I would refer you to chapter six of that report. It laid out a plan and it gave us a timeline for what needed to be accomplished and what could be accomplished if we made the proper investments within a timely manner for synthesis, analysis, modeling, enzymes, informatics, and education. So it was incumbent on program officers across the institutes and agencies to take these requests and make these recommendations and goals timelines. Next, next slide. For glycoscience, lots of people back into this field. Actually, everybody in the field has backed into it because their own avenues of research um, 
basically led them into protein carbohydrate interactions of some sort. And then they were stuck. They were tied up in a traffic jam because they didn't have tools or expertise to move the science forward. And really important science just would just get dropped because they couldn't find a collaborator to move that area forward and answer the questions that came up. That's what we wanted to solve. We wanted to help them get around these traffic jams. Next slide. So as a program officer, I had already done what I could do out of a single institute or with my other colleagues across institutes and agencies, we needed something else that we were going to be able to use to push this field into the broader scientific community. We built up infrastructure over the years, but we really needed, needed to get glycoscience embraced by the broader scientific community. And to do that, we needed a large invest, concerted investment that could go across institutes and could address the deficiencies in the infrastructure. The NIH Common Fund, um, which came out of the um, NIH roadmap, actually um, the CFG was one of the models that was used for this. So we had to convince them that we really needed more money and a different effort to be able to get across the finish line. And that effort was focused essentially on integrating the field with the broader scientific community. And that meant making simple tools that people could use, kits and reagents, um, things of that nature that somebody that was not a glyco expert could actually use to answer their problems and get out of the traffic jam. So the Common Fund was established in 2006 out of the 2004 roadmap. It's been used to support a series of short-term, exceptionally high-impact trans-NIH programs, and certainly Glycomix was obviously trans-NIH. And it was intended to change the way science is conducted by delivering data, tools, and technologies for broad use, which is exactly what we wanted to do. To be competitive for Common Fund pro, um, funding, you need to be transformative, unique, synergistic, cross-cutting, and catalytic and we made a pitch that we fit all of those categories. And next slide. Luckily, we, we made it into the Common Fund. There are a number of hurdles that you have to go through to get into the Common Fund, but we made them through. And um, Dr. Lorsch was the chair, was led out of GM, leadership team, and multiple institutes that were involved in this program officers that represented them are here. Next slide. We developed this common fund effort um, in three stages. There were three arms. Um, we wanted to automate synthesis and provide facile methods for large library synthesis. Um, we wanted to have tools that were familiar and easy to use and commercially available for the study of glycans. And we needed um, integration and analysis tools and a database. Um, so these three became the three arms of the program. I headed the synthesis arm, Carl Kruger headed the, um, the tools arm, and Amanda Malillo and Doug Shealy headed the um, database arm. Next slide. The Common Fund had a def deficiency in that people made these huge programs, but then they fell off the books because you couldn't renew them and people struggled to keep them going. We didn't want to um, fall into that. We wanted a short program that made these tools and technologies and we wanted them translated into commercialization so that they could continue to be developed and upgraded, replenished and um, advertised to the broader scientific community. So we put a SBIR, STTR effort together through multiple institutes, since the Common Fund doesn't use this mechanism, and mirrored the Common Fund efforts um, with SBIRS, TTR funding opportunities. These were extremely successful. We got large numbers of applications every year. Um, we put in about $3.6 million a year over the seven years to get these applications funded and um, to get all of the tools and technologies that were coming out of the common fund translated into companies. Next slide. The synthesis arm solicited um, applications. Um, 
we were interested in targets that were justified on the relevance to human health, and we were really interested in facilitating automation. Next slide. We funded 18 applications. We were able to put large libraries of natural compounds on the market when we developed new chemical and chemoenzymatic methods for facil synthesis so that you could go into a university chemistry department and hand them a paper and they didn't have to be a carbohydrate expert to make you the compound that you wanted. And we were very interested in transitioning these to automation. And we came up with, I think, four different platforms that are now available and uh, commercially available um, to be able to synthesize carbohydrates. So if you put a DNA synthesizer, you could also put in a carbohydrate synthesizer into your cores at your universities. Um, these are still being developed, but for the most part, um, the field is a quantum leap from where it was in 1999. Next slide. Um, chemoenzymatic synthesis is really useful. Anybody can do it if they have the right enzymes. Uh, ERA allowed us to make these library expression libraries and um, the Common Fund allowed us to push this forward, get these all of these um, vectors expressed into enzymes and commercially available through glycoexpression technologies and several other companies that have stepped forward because there's real interest in these enzymes commercially. Next slide. Um, the tools we put out Initially, our 21s for high risk, high um, impact awards and a few U ones that were um, obvious things that could be done immediately. And the R21s were then followed on with that opportunities to apply for U ones. And we got a huge number of really unique tools out of this that are easy to use. Next slide. We've got a reagents and tools that fall within these categories and uh, most of these are being commercialized now or already commercialized. Next slide. The informatics effort was the last effort to go on the books. Um, it's evolving at this point. Um, it's an international effort. It fits in with several other efforts from Japan and, um, and Europe and Australia and Canada. And these tools are all commercially, uh, are all actually freely available on the web uh, through this website. So you can go from your protein to your glycoprotein um, and look at the structures and functions as they exist in the data. Next slide. So these are data, Data analysis tools include standards for metadata, standards for representation, common ontologies, uh, assignment of structures, and simultaneous mining. Um, the PDB has been cleaned up through an effort through the Common Fund. And so if you go in there, if you see carbohydrates attached to your protein, they're actually in the right linkage and appropriate structure. Next slide. So the Common Fund has completed its work. I'm actually sitting in on an evalu the report on the evaluation of the program tomorrow um, out of OD. But as you can see, it was built upon the National Academy report. I think the only thing that uh, the Common Fund couldn't address since it doesn't have educational efforts within the fund um, was the training um, and that's been picked up by GM and Hart Lung, who have put training grants on the books for glycoscience. Next slide. So we've developed catalytic and chemoenzymatic methods. We have automation platforms. We have analysis labeling and modeling tools with demonstrated proof of concept. Most have been commercialized. We have uniform informatics efforts and we're moving forward to integrate glycomics with other molecular databases. And we have the uh, commercially available glycoenzymes. So this program to my mind has fulfilled the National Academy of Science report and one of the things we did was to hold um, large workshops and meetings, symposia, 
for the chemistry division, and we brought David Walt in as one of the panelists to evaluate the work that was done. This was a two-day symposia. It's available online through the NIH um, video website, and um, David was impressed that we had moved and kept to the timeline that the academy had set out for us um, within the seven years we had definitely checked off all the boxes and we're well on the way to the 15-year goals that they set out for the chemical synthesis of carbohydrates um, for the other efforts we likewise had uh, numerous presentations and final symposia which were well attended and highly viewed all of those are also available on the NIH videocast website under archives. Next, next slide, please. Um, so we started out in 2000 with um, NSF laying out a plan and we established the first three criteria through about 20 years of RFAs, FOAs, common um, consortium for functional glycomics and other programs that were held through R01 portfolios um, and the common fund made the effort that was necessary for integration of this with the broader scientific community. Uh, the preliminary data that I've seen from the um, evaluation suggests that we've achieved that goal as well. Next slide. The 2012 report provided the roadmap, provided the timeline, um, pointed us in the right direction, placed the emphasis on synthesis and analysis, modeling, enzymes, informatics, and education. And this informed the efforts of myself and numerous, numerous other program staff at NIH and other federal agencies in terms of how to guide our portfolios and how to present to our bosses to develop the um, necessary funding to bring these across the finish line. Next slide. That's the consortium. That's the common fund team. A lot of those folks were in the consortium for functional glycomics. Um, we met every year and um, reported out from all the different groups in person. And then each of these three teams met regularly, monthly actually, um, by video to work together to develop the program and to move it forward. And I'd like to congratulate them. So at this point, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a question already from uh, Susan Masurga. Hi, Pamela. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Susan Bazarga from Yale University. I, I had a question about uh, 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 the, um, the SBIR STTR decision for this. Right, right. My understanding is that the, you need a, an actual company to get an SBIR and an STTR. So No, you don't. No, you don't. No. Actually, the company just has to be on paper. And so as long as you've contracted with your university, um, as long as you have a piece of paper from the university that says they'll rent you bench space in your laboratory um, to, for your company at a given rate per square foot or whatever, um, then you don't actually have to initiate the company until you have the grant in hand. Right, so, so, so just to understand that that number one, the synthesis seems to have gone more to companies, even if they're just on paper. And then two and three seem to have gone more to academic labs, or that's not true. That's fine. No, that's not, that's not true. So um, academic labs uh, basically push the synthesis forward. And several of them have um, developed their own platforms now for automation, which was supported by the, the this um, common fund effort. But they've also, spun off companies from their laboratories because you know training is one thing making compounds and maintaining machines and pushing that forward is another so um, it's much easier to get a large grant out of the common out of the SBIR program to set up your laboratory as a company 
and um, use technicians to continue to make the enzymes or to continue to make the compounds that people are requesting from you since you published on them. Uh, so that's basically how that's moving forward. But there are several other commercial companies that have come in and uh, partnered with them. So they have essentially taken their um, IP and licensed it um, to move that into commercial platforms. Um, a lot of our chemists developed um, cross-linking reagents, um, tracking reagents, things of that nature. And that IP was purchased by um, companies that are making these products and selling them commercially. The tools themselves, um, some of the people that develop the tools have taken out SBIRs or the sister program, STTR, where you find a company and um, you get a, a technology transfer grant. So part of the money goes to you to develop it and hand it off to the company. And then the company further develops it and commercializes it. So there's two flavors to the business aspect of those. All of federal agencies use SBIR, STTR. And um, the people in our program, the Common Fund program, um, seemed very adept at being able to find partners or to um, work SBIRs into their own, own laboratories. Uh, so can I, so can I ask, uh, this is um, Brenda Bass, can I ask a, a nuts and bolts uh, question? Because sure. um, in your head, you know, there, there's always a they and it goes back to another they and I'm trying to understand how this all gets put into motion. So I think there was a consortium. Um, I don't know how that started. And, um, and then the, it, the consortium, I think, was involved in getting the common fund uh, um, initiative is that, or the program. Are you talking about the consortium for functional glycomics? That, that was a glue grant. Okay. And that arose out of my initiation of conversations with the glycoscience community at, um, at a uh, meeting and continual dialogue with the glycoscience community to develop an application to NIH to take part in the glue grant program. And then several iterations of their grant uh, went back and forth and um, eventually moved into a model where they were going to put together cores and um, an administrative group that would handle requests for the reagents and services of the cores. All the data would be public, would be in a searchable database. So that turned out to be a really exceptional program um, and it continues today at Harvard. But <laughs> that's not the responsibility of it's not the responsibility of a consortium of investigators yeah. to move a field. So portfolio managers, you know, program directors like myself would be the people that look to all of these information that's coming in and look as portfolio managers, we have tools to look at our portfolios, to look at deficiencies, to look at new areas where we would want to invest just like any portfolio manager. And in that regard, we use the scientific community as a sounding board. So I showed you a number of instances where I myself or other members from other program officers from other institutes were involved in holding a series of workshops and symposia and meetings where we could bring in information from people that we invited to tell us what the needs of the community were and what the opportunities were from that community if we could meet those needs. So they all develop white papers. Those white papers, we, we as program officers would sit and digest. And then we would decide if those things look to be necessary to move our portfolios, um, you know, could we put together an FOA or could we partner with other institutes to put together an FOA to move things forward? That went on for almost 20 years to develop the infrastructure for this field and move it forward. When it was essentially at the point where glycoscience was really becoming established and people were in need of moving this into the broader scientific community, that's where 
we as program officers, myself and my colleagues um, from other institutes that were interested in glycoscience worked together um, and made a pitch based on the National Academy report that we, we commissioned to, um, to NIH's Office of the Director because the, com the Common Fund seemed like the logical place to utilize um, their funding to move this into the broader scientific community. Um, that was the Common Fund's mission. That's what we needed to accomplish. So we did the hand glove thing and, and melded with the Common Fund. So we made our pitch to the Common Fund to become part of the Common Fund. They rejected us. We made our pitch again. They rejected us. We made our pitch again and finally got over the hurdles. And, um, and we were able to move into the Common Fund and obtain the funding that we needed to be able to go out and solicit applications to make this field simpler, to get things into kits, to commercialize a lot of materials um, so that we didn't have that traffic jam. You know, all of us as program directors were getting con constant calls from the broader scientific community saying, you know, I backed into this and, oh, I found out that this carbohydrate is involved in turning on this receptor and how do I study it? And so you try to find them a collaborator, but that's a slow process and collaborations don't always meld. So we really wanted them just to be able to have the same access that people in molecular biology have, you know, that you could just go to a company and buy a reagent or buy a kit. And uh, that was the impetus to, to get us through the common fund and into the funding funding area. So yeah, I I but all of those all of those steps are, are driven by program directors who utilize the information they get from reports like the one you're writing. So if you're writing a National Academy report, you're not doing this de novo. I mean, somebody commissions you to write this and they obviously have interest in this field and hopes for utilizing your report to move something forward. So whoever commissioned you to put this report together, um, you know, take advantage of, of their knowledge of the field and what their interests are, what they would like to see out of the report. But I can tell you from glycomics perspective, uh, chapter six, where they laid out, you know, this is, this is the advantages that this field is going to provide us if we move it forward. And these are the things that are necessary. And here's a reasonable timeline for accomplishing X, Y, and Z to be able to get this accomplished. So they gave us a seven, 10, and 15 year timeline under the categories that I laid out. And you know that makes it easy for program officers to check off the boxes and write FOAs and push this forward. We certainly utilize the Academy report in terms of the synthesis and tools and databases um, to say these are things that are necessary, but now we need to make them broadly available and accessible to the broader scientific community. We need to keep them simple and easy to use and so that you don't need to be a glyco expert to be able to utilize them. And that's basically what the Common Fund was about, was making this accessible to the broader scientific community. Thank you. That was really helpful. Are there are there questions? Uh, other questions at the table right now? What was that, Steve? Should I move? Um, uh, can I ask one question? Sure. One more question. So, is there anything that you know you really laid out what we need to put in the consensus report that is most helpful to program directors, program officers? Is there anything you would say uh, was unhelpful? Is there anything we should not put in the report? Don't recommend funding mechanisms. Okay. And remember that this isn't just helpful to program officers, it's helpful to applicants for funding. So I can't tell you how many grants I've read where they cite this report and as justification for whatever it is they're pitching to NIH. Um, you know, be it synthetic methods or commercialization of, of given products. Um, they use the report. They use what the report suggests is important to the field and necessary for moving the field forward. And 
Why is that important? Because the report lays out really clearly what the benefits to human health and DOE and FDA are um, if these things are accomplished. You know, if we can do X, Y, or Z, if we can have these tools available, then this is going to move A, B, and C farther along and save us a lot of money. I mean, the, the folks in the Parkinson's field um, wrote a really, really lovely um, news piece about having all of these um, glyco, glyco products, glycolipids um, available where they weren't before and um, how this was going to open up all new avenues for research in that field. I mean, this is the type of thing that, you know, program officers jump on and that's what we want to see. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we have to we have to move on, but that was so helpful. We really really appreciate your time today. Sure, and I would I would suggest you know the Academy report. There's a PDF. It's it's freely available. You can download it. Take a look at take a look at the intro and the final chapter, chapter six, where they lay out this roadmap. Yeah. And they put together a beautiful pamphlet. It's like a two pager. Um, people can't walk around with a heavy report, but a two page pamphlet, you know, we took this around, we showed it to people, we peddled this and quite honestly, Europe and Japan both jumped on this and developed their own reports on glycoscience for the Europeans and for the Japanese. And I ended up having to present uh, with both of them on what their nations had developed in terms of this field. So you can have really international echoes yep. of what comes out of these reports. Yes, thank you so much. And I did just put the glycoscience report in uh, on our Google Drive for everybody. So uh, thank you again. Good luck. Thanks. Take care, Steve. All right, thanks, Pam. Okay.